Good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Cummings, counsel for the New York State Association of Counties. On behalf of our president, Jack Marin, and executive director, Stephen Aquario, I wanna thank you this morning uh, for coming together uh, this morning for a training on executive order and emergency order powers. I'd also like to thank our sponsors of this workshop, Romer, Wallens, Gold, and Minot, which is a multi-dimensional law firm that focuses its representation of municipalities in public sector employment matters, public finance, and, de and defense litigation. Thank you. Most of all, I wanna thank you, our county members, for continuing to tune in and be engaged with these NISAC workshops. The number of participants prove that our county officials are consistently seeking to supplement their knowledge on issues that impact their residents. We are joined today by Tom Humbach, the, the Rockland County Attorney. When NISAC was putting together a workshop ideas, uh, this one was pitched local, state, and even federal executive and uh, executive order and emergency order powers. My first thought was, wow, uh, training on this issue has never been more timely. I was excited. My second thought is we gotta, have, we gotta find the right person for this. Tom was the first call I made on the topic and within minutes of speaking with him, I knew he'd be perfect. While we all, especially county attorneys, have brushed up on our EO power understanding these past seven months, Tom and Rockland County had a unique perspective a future glimpse and arguably wrote a roadmap on how the COVID pandemic would be handled. This is because only a year earlier, Rockland County battled the measles outbreak. Tom and the leaders of Rockland County studied this EO issue and they used the tools they had to help fight back the spread of this major health concern. Tom will use the knowledge gained by his county's actions, experiences to train you today. We'll now get started. And remember, if you have a question during the presentation, please type it, the question in the panel on the right side of the screen. Uh, we'll try to answer those even as they come in, if it's still timely to the presentation. If it's not, um, meaning uh, we're, we're a little further along, we still get the question and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. Tom, I will now turn this over to you and thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And good morning to everybody who's on, and thank you very much for coming today. Uh, as uh, Patrick said, we're gonna go be talking about the uh, use of emergency directives and orders in, in the state of New York. Um, I know the CDC has just recently made a, a what amounts to a directive um, concerning evictions. That's not gonna be part of this one. I haven't addressed um, federal executive powers here. But uh, what is happening in New York is very significant and is being followed through other parts of the nation. So I think this is gonna be pertinent. Um, the history of executive orders in elected republics and democracies is very thin. The only thing I could find is back in uh, ancient Rome, they had elected consuls in the Republic. Uh, but in times of war, uh, mostly war, but other disasters too, they could appoint the dictator uh, to act for some short period of time in order to deal with the emergency. And they decided this was a necessity primarily because they understood that the legislative process of debate didn't apply itself well, did not apply itself well to handling emergent situations. So here we are in the modern times uh, with the state of New York, and both local executives and state executives have the ability to make emergency directives or orders, depending on which section you look at, um, to handle disasters. So if we look at our first slide, we talk about what disasters are, because disasters uh, are the foundation of when these things come into effect. And you know, I'm gonna turn off my camera here only so that you guys can focus on the slides, I'm not that interesting to look at. Um, so for local emergencies, disasters are defined in executive law section 20. For uh, the state emergency orders there in 29A, they are largely similar um, lists. Uh, things, easily anticipated things, fire, flood, earthquake, um, uh, epidemics is an important one. Um, the definitions of what these things are is largely untested in court. Um, I'm going to talk about epidemic in the, on, when we go to when we go to the next slide. But uh, other than that, we have 
every year we have emergency orders issued for snowstorms uh, or hurricanes and things like that. Um, these are usually to close uh, roads or locations for a short period of time. Uh, in Rockland County, for example, Hurricane Floyd and Superstorm Sandy both struck the county very hard, and we were out for approximately a week at the longest. Uh, Long-term emergency orders are not something that we're accustomed to. They just don't often happen. Uh, right now, we're in an extreme situation with COVID. Uh, this nine months of emergency is far beyond anything that's been recorded in any case law or any newspaper uh, for emergency orders that direct our behavior. Uh, um, probably the next longest that I could find would be related to the 9-11 um, tragedy where courts and certain um, labor law uh, matters were suspended with respect to cleanup in, in the southern part of Manhattan. And that was not for as long as this. It was only for approximately 60 days. So on the next slide are uh, some cases that do attempt to define the disaster of an epidemic. And these are particularly pertinent nowadays because uh, there are a lot of challenges that we're facing. And one of them is what are the extent of the power of the state and the municipalities to do uh, to handle these emergencies. And uh, with the measles outbreak, we got two conflicting decisions out of the trial courts, out of the Supreme Courts in Rockland County and Kings County. Uh, I, of course, handled the Rockland County matter, and we were before a judge who felt that uh, this was indeed um, a situation. Oh, sorry, I got it backwards. The judge found that the number of cases did not constitute an emergency. Um, that it was debatable whether the, the limited number of measles cases uh, compared to the population of the county in general constituted an epidemic. And so he, uh, that judge did not permit Rockland County to exercise uh, emergency orders to control the uh, rate of infection that was happening in our county at that time. Uh, however, in Brooklyn, where there was a similar situation uh, and um, similar numbers and percentages, that judge referring to Rockland County, the Rockland County judge, and disagreeing with him, said that it was indeed an emergency and that in his judgment, um, the uh, executives in New York City could indeed do emergency orders in order to stem the tide of the, uh, of the, of the outbreak which just goes to show there is not a set state of law here on what constitutes an emergency or a disaster, which is the foundation of an emergency. And even looking at the list of different disasters between the local powers in section 24 and the state powers in section 29A uh, as it exists today, uh, there are several differences uh, they have added many things to the state, um, the state law that are not for the local localities. Um, also, the state law, where it is similar, does have matters that seem very local: high water, a landslide, a mudslide, and and uh, also has things that you wouldn't expect to have in New York, like volcanic activity or a cyber event. And some of these things look like you know, a cyber event, if a disaster was declared in terms of that, that would be a novel thing. And I, there would be a lot of, I think, uh, discussion about where the limits lay with something like that. Um, moving on to the powers of municipal executives. Where one of these disasters occurs, the municipal executives. Now, this applies both to the county executives, uh, any other county executive level uh, official. Um, but also to mayors of cities and villages and town superintendents. Uh, all of them can declare a state of emergency. And state of emergency has to be addressed to a 
you know, one of these defined disasters that we've been talked about. Um, each one can only control matters in its geographic area of authority. But of course, with counties in particular, there's going to be overlap. So you might have a county rule and a town rule uh, or order uh, with respect to a particular disaster. Uh, they can be contrary to each other. And the more restrictive is going to be enforced. Uh, I don't think the town, there's not been any cases on it, but I have, I can't imagine that a town will be able to uh, nullify the county's more restrictive order within the town's borders. Um, it's going to be the most restrictive rule is my guess is how that would come out if there was a conflict. Um, just uh, a note, early on in this particular uh, COVID disaster, Governor Cuomo did issue one of his directives forbidding county executives uh, and lo other local officials from making their own uh, orders unless they were approved by the state. So right now, all the local authority is limited to whatever the state will allow. And you know that's just a note for the ongoing uh, crisis that we have right at the moment. Um, but in any emergency uh, order, there has to be a finding based on a determination of fact. And as we saw in the cases that we just went through, those findings can be challenged. Um, the, the, the Supreme Court um, in Rockland County found that there was in fact no disaster going on uh, during the measles crisis, uh, whereas in Brooklyn it was the opposite. Um, these findings then are subject to article 78 we did go to the appellate division uh in an attempt to reverse the trial court's decision about the the measles outbreak and the appellate division let the trial court's decision stand there was no formal appeal before all of that ended um the measles outbreak ended so the lawsuit was essentially moot there was no executive law uh, executive order from the county at that time. So there's not been a high court resolution of um, what exactly needs to be proved, what level of proof there needs to be, uh, all the things that were discussed in uh, in those cases. Um, the form of the order, uh, since we have people from all over the state here, I'm sure we've all seen different forms of how these things uh, come out. Uh, oftentimes they're referred to as executive orders. Um, I style mine as proclamation of a disaster and a local emergency order because that happens to be the words in uh, section 24, uh, granting the powers. Uh, but either way, it's gonna be the intention and effect that is gonna control and uh, whatever has been, you have been using, unless it's been challenged and found to be wanting, you, it's, you're welcome to keep on using. I can't imagine there'd be a successful challenge as long as the intent is clear from the substance of the of the uh, written order or the or proclamation of a disaster. Um, I, you should have a written also determination when there has to be a finding based upon a determination of fact that there's a disaster, it should be written uh, and there should be a record kept as with anything you would have an Article 78 action on in case it's challenged. Uh, so that you have a record to base your defense of the disaster on. Um, the last point here is that, in all honesty, this sidesteps the representative form of government to deal with an emerging condition. Uh, it, the Attorney General, back in 1993, recognized that the county chief executives are given extraordinary powers during local emergencies. This is a theme that is echoed loudly by the current um, district court decisions that have been made with respect to Governor Cuomo's state level orders. Um, there is extreme deference given to uh, both the uh, wisdom and rationale for the orders and the courts generally aren't gonna go uh, finding that there are problems unless they are significant problems. But uh, as to the differences of opinion between the court about what constitutes a, a order that goes over the line, we're gonna address that uh, towards the end of the uh, discussion. But uh, continuing on with the powers of municipal, municipal executives on the next page, um, the, the constraints of the local orders 
and it's a little bit uh, has to do with the challenges that we'll discuss in detail later. But the statute specifically, this is Section 24, does not permit the local executive to act in contravention of state or federal constitutions or federal law. Um, again, this is exactly what is being challenged these days. Uh, there is a nod to the fact that you know it's not an absolute dictatorship once you start issuing these orders. Nobody really thinks it is, but um, we have to. Uh, honor at least in thought the, the the constitutions that we that we work under um the primary acts to be done with these orders is to preserve the health and welfare of the public and you can't make orders at the expense of the public's health and welfare this is, has to do with the world trade center uh disaster site litigation um where governor pataki did not suspend labor law provisions although he could have, and so the court found that um, despite the fact that there was a disaster, people, the state had an obligation uh, or the employers had an obligation to um, protect the workers uh, through the industrial code and everything else. So I, I would take this case primarily to say that the directives or orders should be read read carefully and only include that which is in them and not to make any assumptions that there are further powers being exercised when they're not specifically stated. Uh, just in general uh, concept of uh, statute reading is that this is not common law, this is not to be broadly written, I mean, sorry, broadly read or interpreted. These kinds of municipal orders as well as the state orders should be read uh, strictly um, especially under the circumstances that there's not even legislation behind them, uh, putting them into effect. So moving on to the uh, continuing on the powers of municipal executives on the next page. Um, these are all requirements straight out of the law. The orders must be made in conjunction with the de declared local state of emergency. So you can't just make a local order. Uh, it's a matter of form. You have to proclaim a disaster and what it's about. And as I said, to have kind of a file establishing it. I mean, often it's easy. You know, there's been a there's been a huge superstorm. Sandy came through, or um, or or even the measles and and COVID. Um, but the more they're going to be challengeable, um, the more record you have to have. Um, a state of emergency, which is just declaring uh, a status can only be in effect for 30 days at a time. However, executives can renew them on 30-day bases. Uh, we renew them uh, regularly. We just keep a calendar to do that. Um, the, the renewal can be as long or as short as you choose. Um, if there's a change of facts to justify the extension, you should probably write the uh, facts that justify the extension into, into the renewal so that, um, so that it's on the record. Um, orders have to be made to protect life and property or bring the emergency situation under control. Again, this is very little litigated. There is not a lot of case law or precedent to tell us what those limits really mean. Uh, everybody's kind of going by the seat of their pants and trying to do the right thing, uh, but uh, the more it's a direct protection, the more safe the order is going to be, the more specific the order is, the more the more the easier it is to justify what it is that the executive has done. Um, local laws can be suspended by local executives. You can only suspend the local laws in your jurisdiction. I do not believe a county can suspend a town law, for example. Um, no authority is granted to suspend state or federal laws. Um, and importantly, suspensions of law by local officials are limited to five day periods. They can be renewed just like the proclamation of the emergency. But um, if uh, you know there's a local aspect that we have a local aspect to uh, in rem uh, tax sales about uh, in person service and uh, things like that. If that was a situation that needed to be remedied because of a particular disaster, uh, our local executive can suspend that, for example. Not that it's been done, but it's that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, we also have a law that, that prohibits the use of drones over other properties. 
if this was a disaster more in the line of a hurricane or a fire, uh, perhaps that would be relaxed if the use of the drones would um, would help to find people, help to um, you know alleviate the suffering from the disaster. Um, importantly, local legislatures can terminate a local emergency order at any time. Um, the executive does not have unchecked power to just continue an emergency for as long as they like. Uh, the legislature has a duty to be in touch with its constituents and where it deems necessary to step in and limit executive power. Um, there is no stated exemption from veto on this, uh, which means that you know if the if the executive really disagrees with the legislature, um, the legislature is going to have to come up with a two-thirds uh, vote to overcome it, at least under our charter. Um, or whatever is necessary to overcome a veto in your locality. Um, moving on to the next page. Uh, limits of authority and immunity for acts of officers. Um, 25.5 speaks uh, not only for the officers, but it, it generally speaks towards the municipality itself. If people are harmed by the exercise of these orders, however it may be, then there can be some immunity for it, unless it's a violation of the Constitution, mostly. Um, if it's a, it's more for tort type liability. Um, this is also the section. If you look under the cases citing this section, it's also is talking about the authority of the executives, and about how courts aren't to be second guessing the executives that the courts are presumed not to have the, the breadth of knowledge and the, or the depth of knowledge really, and the day-to-day -day, uh, interest in the matter to be the experts. Um, and this, this goes again in the tension with the constitutional rights that uh, people often feel are being violated during these emergencies. Um, similarly, officers are, couldn't, are potentially able to claim qualified uh, or governmental immunity for harm caused by policymaking activities. Um, this is a protection when decisions need to be made right away and um, they're not patently violations of the uh, constitutional or other rights uh, or state constitutional rights of the uh, people being affected by the order. The uh, Moving on, we go on to the governor's powers. This is under 29A. Now, 29-A, or 29A as I'm gonna call it here, um, was amended on March 2nd, 2020, uh, at the outset of this COVID uh, disaster we're facing right now. It sunsets on April 20th, uh, 2021, and uh, importantly, Section 29-A was radically changed on March 2nd. Uh, prior to March 2nd, there were no directives. Um, those only came in recently. Uh, it also added several uh, categories of disaster, which didn't exist um, previously. Um, cyber events, terrorism, nuclear chemical biological release, uh, I don't know exactly why these were added for this one year period, but there they are. Um, again, the governor can declare a state of disaster emergency under this law and has the power to suspend laws and make directives to cope with the emergency. Um, the governor has taken to doing it in an executive order format uh, where he makes an executive order and declares whether he's suspending laws or uh, making directives. Uh, there's no particular formula, he, but he just has to uh, explain what it is he's doing as you would with a law. Um, but he does have to cite any particular laws that are being suspended. So if something is not specifically described, it's not suspended. Um, Again, as with the local emergency orders, these sidestep the forms of representative government and home rule in the state. Uh, the governor's orders, the directives, I should call them, because that's what they are, um, 
do go down, they challenge charter, not challenge, I mean, they may have been asked for, frankly, but they have suspended um, charter provisions for charter counties, uh, mostly concerning the due date of taxes and interest and penalties. Uh, the governor has taken actions. He has uh, delayed elections. There were a couple of special elections that didn't happen. Uh, you know, there are questions about where does this directive power, uh, what are the limits of it? And we're going to discuss that a little bit later too. But uh, the governor has taken broad swaths of, uh, of, of power in terms of directing individual behavior, um, as well as uh, creating new policies and new uh, structures in, in the law. And uh, continuing on with the governor's powers on the next page. Um, we have some traditional examples of suspensions and their effects. Um, importantly, in Perietti versus Sampson, first typo, Sampson should be, uh, the courts ruled that the rules of statutory interpretation for exec apply to executive orders under 29A. Well, that's important. That goes to the point that uh, being, that the courts interpret them. Uh, if there's a list of items, you're restricted to the list. If there are uh, matters that are not addressed in the law that could have been, or the directive that could have been addressed in the directive, they're not in there. Uh, there was argument in Perietti versus Samson that certain things were meant that weren't there, and the court decided that the, that the court knows how to interpret these rules just like it interprets any other rules. Um, Also, it gave the in recently it had ratified the uh, the uh, suspension of a provision of the New York City Charter. Um, so that that's been through the appellate division. So that was found to be a valid exercise of the directive. Um, you know, importantly, and in terms of kind of where the limitations are, uh, the judge and people be Stanley was looking at certain uh, issues that affected criminals um, or people accused of crimes, I should say, I apologize, these are preliminary hearings. And it uh, affected the civil liberties that are granted through some of our procedures in the criminal, in the criminal uh, jurisdiction and made the comment, the suspension of civil liberties always seems well advised in a crisis People focus on fighting the battle, in this case a virus, and collateral damage on liberties and afterthought that could be dealt with later and condemned in retrospect by history. He did this in holding, upholding the governor's directive uh, that uh, extended some time for the state to act um, for a preliminary hearing to the detriment of Mr. Stanley. Um, and why well, I felt that it was regrettable that in this instant an in individual might be hurt, that there was a larger um, that there was a larger societal good to be had in extending that in extending that deadline. Um, moving on to the next page, um, similar to the local similar to the local uh, orders, the governor uh, cannot act in contravention of state or federal constitutions or federal law. Um, the directives must be made during a state of disaster emergency. Uh, there's no requirement in 29A for a specific declaration, but the governor has made a record of what the disaster is. He recites it in uh, all of his executive orders um, and, and has a longer statement of it in the initial uh, 202. Um, there's no, the suspensions and directives must be on point they have to be necessary to cope with the disaster and cannot be made and must be made uh, in the interest of the health or welfare of the public. Um, that becomes a debatable question and one person's what is necessary and another versus another person's what is necessary is different. And again, the courts are not going to invade this area to decide as long as there's a rational basis that the governor can explain. Um, unlike 
the local directives or the local orders that can only be in effect for five days, gubernatorial directives can go for 30 days. They're also renewable, like the local ones. Uh, the state legislature, like uh, in localities, can terminate the suspension or, of a law or directive at any time. I'm sorry, the, the governor can also suspend laws uh, just like the localities can. He can, of course, suspend state laws, uh, which he has done, um, and as well as regulations uh, in terms of uh, a lot of it has to do with loosening up licensing laws to allow further testing and, and medical personnel. Um, but he's also changed election laws um, uh, to permit things that are not in this in the current law. Uh, this is not stated in Section 29A to be exempt from a veto. So presumably, the state legislature, both houses, would have to be would have to uh, have a veto-proof majority if they were actually going to uh, terminate a suspension or directive or take away the uh, power to issue them. Um, again, officers are free from liability from the implementation of the orders uh, that's set forth in 29A. It is a protection, again, for these uh, kind of quick decisions that have to be made. Um, on the next page, we talk about uh, the enforcement and penalties. Uh, you know, I have said many times that a directive or an order without a penalty is just guidance or a suggestion, uh, because without a penalty, there's no reason for anybody to follow it other than if they agree with it. If they, if they disagree with it, there's no reason for them to follow it. So during the Rockland, uh, in in the executive law, it's a criminal penalty under Section 24, which is, has to do with the localities. Uh, it makes any violation of a local emergency order a B misdemeanor. And uh, you know there were a lot of questions during the measles outbreak. Well, how are you going to enforce this? The county had made a law, or a, sorry, a local executive order that said persons under 18 who are not otherwise immune to measles by either having it before or having been vaccinated could not uh, congregate in public places of gathering. And the whole idea was that this, there were a lot of people who are not immune, mostly small children under six months old and older people or immunocompromised people. And uh, the object of the order was to allow, uh, you know, people to go about their normal daily activities, but people who were just not getting the vaccine, um, you know, had that, there were some consequences for choosing not to be vaccinated. And so the, there were a lot of questions about how are you gonna enforce this? Are you gonna be checking people's medical records and things like this? And honestly, the county executive, a lot like the governor has recently, has said, look, we're not here to punish people. We're not gonna be checking your papers, but, we want you to know that there is a punishment. Uh, it, it is a B misdemeanor, and that's how serious this is that he chose to make an order. But he did. there was no structure for enforcement, and it ended up being a great PR coup. Um, lots of people started talking about the need for vaccines and things like that, and it worked great. We got 75,000 people vaccinated in Rockland County uh, that year, um, in part due to the publicity rendered by making an order that uh, really brought to the attention of people that it was dangerous to be walking around unvaccinated when you could be vaccinated. Uh, there is no current express authority in section 24 for civil penalties. I mean, making people criminals for violating an order that says stay off this road because there are wires down seems extreme. That happens, or the, the, it's too windy to travel across this bridge and making somebody a criminal over that, it could be an extreme situation. Um, it's theoretically possible, either through legislative approval or as part of an emergency order, to have civil penalties. It's never been tested, but since there is an ability to make orders, uh, an order that states a civil penalty is a possibility as a matter of regulation. Um, it's something that people may want to think about. It provides a real punishment that doesn't have the high bar of, of a criminal action and also is uh, that the person making the rule, the executive, uh, then can have his employees enforce themselves 
in a knowledgeable way. That's actually a big issue with these executive orders. Uh, the governor has made all these executive orders. They are lengthy and they are complex and oftentimes they are not specific. Um, people who disagree would say vague and ambiguous. Um, so people call up constantly, they call up our government saying, what does this mean? What does, what, you know, what do these provisions mean? And we do our best to look at them. I frankly counsel my, uh, my clients not to be too specific about it because we don't often know directly. Uh, we have a connection through to the governor's office. We can ask them for interpretation. Uh, but that has its problems too, because if someone actually receives a penalty for violating a governor's order, it's not the governor or a governor's administration that penalizes them, except for licensing matters that go through the state. But something like a gathering, if you're actually receiving a ticket for having a gathering, it's going to a local criminal court at this point. And so it's a judge in a local criminal court who's going to decide whether you've broken the law or not, not the governor. Um, so the interpretations that come out may be persuasive, but if they're not in the executive order themselves, uh, they're not part of the rule that the court should be considering. Um, so if there were civil penalties enforceable by the very government making the rule, of course, you'd come closer to the true intent of the enforcement, and that can be a good thing. Um, the state responses, which are on the next page, um, also, as I said, there, the state responses have been largely criminal. Um, the penalties are not inherent in the statutory scheme. Uh, unlike Section 24, uh, there is no misdemeanor or civil penalty attached in uh, to Section 29A. Uh, so again, the, the governor had to come up with me methods of having this to be enforceable, so it's not merely a suggestion. Uh, the District Attorney Association agreed that uh, there is no direct penalty authorized by law in Section 24. Uh, the governor has bootstrapped penalties by reference to the public health law. Um, he states that in the executive orders that uh, these executive orders can be, such as the gatherings and wearing masks, can be enforced through Section 12 and 12 hyphen B of the criminal, of the, sorry, the public health law. Section 12 actually is civil, but it's reserved to the state commissioner of health. And I don't know of any state commissioner of health prosecutions under these executive orders. Section 12B does create criminal penalties. So any uh, peace officer can enforce them. Um, they are violation and misdemeanor level penalties. Um, and also in gubernatorial guidance, uh, the governor talked about uh, bringing charges related to resisting arrest and obstruction of governmental administration, where police may go to a gathering of too many people and say, hey, you have to break it up, and then people start arguing with the police. That would be resisting arrest or obstruction of governmental administration. Uh, also uh, mentioned, this, particularly with respect to the number of people who can be in a locale or in, in a structure that building uh, departments can enforce. Uh, the limited uh, capacities, uh, just as they would at the full capacities. Uh, I haven't seen any cases that came out of such a such a prosecution, but uh, all, but the governor raised that as an option. Uh, oftentimes, the governor refers to the local health department. I know local health departments in some counties have been going out and doing some kind of enforcement activity. I personally don't see the authority mostly because the local health departments can only enforce statutorily the um, sanitary code. And these directives are not part of the sanitary code. And I don't see any clear indicator that the governor has directed that they are or that he can. So um, there's a difference of opinion out there in the world about how this is handled by local health departments. And, um, you know, every county attorney should be looking at that to, to, of their own accord. Um, again, there are no civil penalties from the state. 
none has been attempted or discussed. Again, if the governor did create some kind of civil penalty in one of his directives, it could be held up. Uh, there's absolutely no precedent for such a thing, but we're in unprecedented times. So the last part of the procedure on the next page, uh, the overview of preparedness and sharing um, in, sec in the portion about local executive preparedness, there is a substantial uh, amount of text involving making plans for disasters um, and um, having a disaster preparedness commission at the local and state levels, um, which is on the next page, which is on the next slide. And um, anybody who's interested in finding these things can get them from the state. I don't have a disaster preparedness plan from the state concerning disease. Um, local localities are permitted but not required to make disaster preparedness plans. Um, that's mostly, I think, uh, permitting you to hire, uh, you know, making it clear that you can hire consultants and things like that because, of course, local governments can't do anything that they're not authorized by law to do. So this authorizes them to make a disaster preparedness plan at the very least. Um, and it gives some guidance about what should be in the plans, um, including an ability to create a registry of disabled persons. Uh, I served uh, for some time on the county's Disability Advisory Council, and I know that they were very happy with their ability to get a reverse 911 list for uh, first responders in the event of a widespread disaster um, so that uh, uh, there could be calls made and check-ins made for people with uh, disabilities who may not be able to care for themselves where in the case of a hurricane or a large fire uh, situation or something like that to make sure that they got the care that they needed um, and responses from first responders and things like that. Um, uh, the rest of the, the, the rest of the material uh, concerning the preparedness and sharing uh, states that the local municipalities can share material. You don't have to enter into an IMA. Um, you can make requests of each other. Counties, to a certain extent, can uh, cannot commandeer material, but can uh, direct material from one town to be used for the benefit of another. Uh, interestingly, we go all the way to the morbid point that Executive Law Section 27 permits new officers to be appointed temporarily, I guess by the existing legislature or uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, in the event that a normal succession is not available. So uh, the state law has gone all the way to the point of the destruction of various government, which it would be a really unfortunate thing to happen, but there it is. Um, there's, a, there's a tool to be used in the event that your county executives or your legislature are um, not able to perform their duties anymore. Um, and at this point, we're moving on to the core challenges. These core challenges I discuss, which are which come on the next slide, um, I'm discussing COVID core challenges. I, I briefly went into the measles core challenges. Uh, there's actually still an open case in the measles. Uh, we there were a lot of challenges under Article 78 when the measles epidemic ended and all the orders concerning the measles ended, both local health department orders and executive orders. Um, all the Article 78s were deemed moot. Article 78s have prospective relief. They get rid of a rule. Um, they don't have retrospective relief. They don't give you damages for something that already happened. So um, the only thing we have left is a series of school parents who felt aggrieved by our orders keeping children out of school to, who were not otherwise immune. Uh, during the measles crisis uh, in, a, in certainly certain high, highly impacted areas. And um, they're seeking damages based on the Fourth Amendment violations of due process and First Amendment uh, concerning um, uh, violation of their religious right to not be um, uh, vaccinated, they're pinning it on a religious exemption that we have here in New York. That's ongoing and we'll find out what happens with that. Our position is that this was not a religious uh, restriction. It was uh, neutral on its face and uh, they uh, disagree. We'll leave it at that for now. Don't wanna to comment too much on an ongoing case. 
Um, so the core challenges concerning COVID, uh, many are centered around activities affiliated with religion, uh, churches and synagogue capacity for services, overnight camps, um, that certain, that uh, the Jewish camp operators say that their operation of their camp is significant to religious purposes. Um, you know, there are also cases about a law firm uh, that disagrees with the Empire State uh, Development Corp uh, and what its capacity for being open should be, uh, particularly under phase three and, and earlier. Um, there are strip clubs and restaurants and all sorts of people also bringing challenges, um, but all for constitutional rights, whether they're takings, whether they're infringements on religious liberty, um, or substantive uh, due process violations of their right to bring up their children. Um, they're all bringing up religious um, or other constitutional um, challenges to the current executive orders. Uh, almost all of them are in the preliminary injunction stage where there have been any decisions at all. Uh, some of them have not even made it through that stage. Um, I think in one of them, there was a uh, motion to dismiss that was decided, but they're all early on and not final determinations, even at the uh, trial court level. Um, just to round them up, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of them with a little bit more specificity to give you everybody a taste of what's going on. Uh, the New York federal courts, uh, the northern district, largely the northern district and the with some in the Western and, and one in the Eastern, have largely followed Jacobson versus Massachusetts, uh, which uh, the judge and county of Butler versus Wolf analyzed um, as constituting a suspension of constitutional rights in the times of an epidemic. Uh, Jacobson was decided in 1905 before we had our analyses of heightened scrutiny, strict scrutiny, and all those different methods that we use depending on what kind of rights are being violated and in um, you know what and, and what the facial sufficiency of the laws are. And um, he points out that the Jacobson was decided prior to these, and perhaps we ought to update our Jacobson um, uh, legis not legislation, jurisprudence in order to make it a more uh, modern analysis. Um, right now, uh, the judge in County of Butler, as he describes it, the implications that there has to be a substantial egregious violation to warrant court intervention to the point where anybody would say, anybody would say it's a violation. And we don't have the, the, the nuance of whether it's a strict scrutiny analysis or a heightened scrutiny analysis or otherwise. Um, so the first case I wanted to talk about in particular is the Association of Jewish Camp Operators versus Cuomo. Um, they feel that the orders are discriminatory, discriminatory to religious versus secular use of camps and interference with religious upbringing. Um, the legislative immunity alleged by the governor um, is a defense that was brought up there. The governor alleged in this case, as well as another one, but it didn't get uh, decided in the other one because it was brought up in a reply, uh, is that in making these executive orders, he's legislating. The court strongly disagreed. Uh, so on the next on the next slide, you'll see Association of Jewish Camp Operators and the citation there if you want to take it down. Um, the court just could not see its way to saying that the process of making executive orders was unchallengeable or that the orders themselves as the governor uh, apparently tried to to allege was unchallengeable um, so we're still able to go into court to challenge these uh, on that decision um, the court relies strongly on Jacobson as I said to permit the exercise of police powers as they see fit um, the courts will not dispute the determination of wisdom or efficacy of measures of each of any of these uh, matters, which goes to my point about that uh, it's a very low bar on these matters. Um, and in this case, the court said, even if strict scrutiny was applied, uh, the prevention of COVID has, been de COVID has been determined to be a compelling state interest, which is important. And that's actually from the Supreme Court. Um, Judge Roberts found that the prevention of COVID is a compelling state interest. 
Um, in Luke's catering, which is on the next slide, uh, without an analysis of what a directive is, finds that executive orders are effective use of uh, police power, um, found that Jacobson authority is only exceeded when there is no substantial relation of protection of the public health, or that the directive is a plain and palpable invasion of rights, again, setting quite a low bar for these directives. Um, something that I see in many of these cases is that the defendants are kind of flying blind. They don't seem to have the experts uh, putting in affidavits uh, to counter the state's uh, determinations. However, the courts, as I said, are looking at this kind of in an Ar Article 78 kind of uh, level of analysis that as long as there's some kind of reason for the state to do what it's done, it doesn't matter if there's a, a counter opinion, we're going to go with the state. So even if they did bring in uh, expert witnesses on the uh, complainant side, I don't know that they necessarily win. Um, uh, importantly, uh, the, the, it's been found in multiple cases that there is no taking here. Uh, the, the, because entire industries aren't shut down permanently and with no, and especially in phase four, with no possibility of making any kind of income, there is uh, no uh, regulatory taking uh, happening. Um, and also because the situation is temporary, which I think uh, uh, has been argued that in the absence of a, a criteria for the end or a date for the end that the, that the governor shouldn't be arguing that it's uh, temporary. Um, in Bimbers versus Delwood on the next page, um, it was argued, this is, this, these uh, bullet points are out of the complaint. Um, this is the position many people are taking. Uh, that the executive law is unconstitutional because it transfers the power of the legislature to the executive, uh, and that the executive orders are ultra vires. These are uh, typical of, of, of these cases. On free speech, it singles out um, non-obscene exotic dancing uh, to be closed versus other live entertainment. Uh, this difference between two similar but different items has come up in many different ways in Seuss, uh, versus Cuomo, which is about uh, rabbis and priests arguing that their facilities should be open as much as any restaurant. The court found that the distinctions were arbitrary. Um, similarly, in Demartile, where uh, a restaurant also operated as a catering hall and the function was the same, but the name was different, the court found that it was arbitrary to distinguish between them, but didn't find it was unconstitutional, but an in opposite apl application of the law. Um, at the, at the time and also uh, was a uh, was uh, not treating people equally under the law. I, I just want to conclude uh, on, the, on the last page there's another case Elmsford apartment challenges the eviction freezes uh, the governor is improperly legislating. Um, again the court was loath to rule on a state matter as a matter of state sovereignty also it's something that comes up in many of these cases that the states are sovereign and that's another reason why the federal courts are not getting involved this might be a matter for state courts um, there are several cases that have found gubernatorial executive orders to be uh, being used too indiscriminately uh, bailey's campground south bay united pentecostal church and Butler versus Wolf, all from out of state, Maine, the Ninth Circuit, and Pennsylvania in particular, um, have found that perhaps Jacobson, it's time for Jacobson to go and for a more nuanced decision making process to be made, um, especially where we have these long term, well, we're having this long term um, uh, disaster where there are certain places that do not actually have. Um, significant effects. In some counties in New York, there are very light effects of COVID, but since we are being governed centrally, um, you know, what goes for the most concentrated places to cure those issues is being applied also to places that do not seem to have such a significant problem, and those are the arguments that are being made successfully in some of these courts. Um, so, um, on the next page is uh, a uh, picture that sums up what many of these uh, challenges to the executive orders are feeling. 
And uh, topics to look for following that are um, challenges concerning this new normal uh, matter. You can change the page. Um, this, uh, what is the new normal? Are we gonna have a change in our expectations of government from a legislative matter, uh, from you know, being governed by representatives to something that is far more centralized with the executive? Um, you know, people are questioning what is the end date for this disaster? Uh, or what's the end criteria so we can have some expectation. Um, the place of the legislature, new powers to the governor. Um, perhaps the governor's uh, powers should be ana analyzed under a Borealis analysis, uh, where, which is the, also the portion cap analysis, where the New York State Court of Appeals uh, very strongly felt that uh, certain executives were over doing their power when they were invading the legislative domain by making policy decisions. Um, and there are tests in Boreale and its progeny about when does executive action under say a regulatory scheme uh, invade the legislative uh, area of making policy and balancing the harms to people when regulations are made because every regulation benefits somebody and harms somebody else. Um, that's something that has not been addressed by any court. Nobody's brought it up as far as I know in any cases, but uh, it could be ripe ground for discovering the uh, limits of what these directives can do or local emergency orders also. Um, and you know, what's the proper vehicle for, for a challenge? You know, if everybody's happy with what an order does, it doesn't matter. But you know the challenges are important. We live in the United States. We're here to petition our government for relief, uh, even against our own government. Um, and so the proper vehicle, sometimes Article 78, sometimes a plenary action in the event of a constitutional violation, or uh, if the process uh, that used to make the order was incorrect. And uh, I would advise you to speak to your counsel on those matters if that comes to you or your uh, constituents. And with that, I see that it's uh, 1058, and I'm going to wrap it up, if, absent any questions. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, Pat Cummings here again. That, that was that was great, um, and that, that answered a lot of a lot of questions I had on the topic, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, we do have a few questions that came in on, on topics uh, that you that you've you you touched on in the presentation, but maybe. Um, if you can provide a little bit more clarification on these, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple here, if you got time. Sure. Um, so the first one is, is um, one you, you just just uh, talked on. Is, the question is, how long may a New York governor extend a declared state of emergency, assuming there's no legislative action? Is there, is there a time limit for these powers, or is, is this something that um, the, the court, that, that just has to be a, a court action to, to ever, um, get involved with that. Yeah, the legislation gives no time limits, neither in the local nor the statewide, does it say there's a maximum number of renewals. There have to be renewals. Um, I think that um, if it's not the governor or the legislature's decision, if it comes down to the people, uh, there would have to be a court action. And I think that probably uh, the most, um, the, the strongest argument would be like there is no more disaster and to have some kind of uh, determination of that for the governor to be able or the local official to say well not only do i define when there is a disaster but in an article 78 way my decision trumps any other any other uh, determination on the matter as long as there's some kind of rationale that i have seems to give a lot of powers to just keep things in disaster for say an administration that didn't um didn't see eye to eye with the uh, with the constituents um and so it would be putting you know the the fox in charge of the hen house as it were in terms of keeping an, an emergency going perhaps longer than the emergency actually exists so that would be the challenge great thanks Sam. Um, here's another one that, uh, from from earlier in your your presentation when you talked about local uh, EO powers. Um, in a future health uh, emergency, when a county passes an EO, um, it's 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 controlling. I think you as you mentioned within just the county borders itself.
but can it suspend relevant local town laws? And if so, does the EO need to, to specify the exact town laws or uh, that are suspended, or is it is it just like an implication that that if there's a conflict, the the local county uh, EO controls? In terms of specificity, which is the easy part of the question, I would say yes. You have to be as specific as possible. Any executive order should be as specific and uh, you know well-rounded as possible in order to ensure that you're going to get the result you want from a court enforcing it. Um, uh, so if you're suspending a statute, yes, you should name the statute, um, you know, at least by its codification. Um, if not, it's a uh, local law number or whatever. But yes, it should be very specifically stated. Um, I do not believe, I don't have found a case where this was challenged or where this was attempted to be done. Um, but I do not believe, say, a count, the only places where we're having a lot of overlap is between counties and towns and villages and perhaps cities. Um, mm -hmm. um, I do not believe that the county could suspend a local law belonging to another jurisdiction. Got it. So if there's a local, so it would go with that levels of, uh, of restrictiveness analysis that I had that the more restrictive rule, whatever it is, whether it's the executive order or the town or village rule would be the enforceable um, level. Great, that makes sense. That, thanks, Tom. Um, that those are the, the questions that came in. Uh, for all those listening, if you if you you know, in, in hindsight, you think of a question that you that you want to ask, email me. Um, I I will uh, definitely I'll work on those in conjunction with Tom. We'll we'll, we'll get you an answer um, as soon as possible on those. But I want to thank. Um, you all again for joining us uh, with this training. Uh, Tom, uh, thank you for this. That was great. This um, presentation will be on the NISAC website along with all our workshops that, that we've done throughout the month um, so that you can uh, share this with, with your county and, and other officials that didn't have either if you want to go back as a refresher and or if, uh, you want to share this with county officials that didn't have the time to uh, watch this live. Um, I also want to just make a note before we go that NYSEC does has another workshop today at two o'clock on lessons learned from the COVID-19 uh, and emergency management. Um, that should, I think that's about another hour and 15 from two to three. Um, we would love if you could join again. Uh, again, if not, this that will also be on the NYSEC website to, to be able to view um, or, or look at it at a later time. So. Uh, again, on behalf of NYSAC, thank you for joining us, and uh, that's going to conclude the presentation. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, all.